Hello and welcome to the Church Militant Podcast, where we aim to encourage you to contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints, to consider Christ as worthy of all sacrifice, to take up the weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, and fight the good fight of faith. Today's episode, I want to continue to discuss prayer, and as I do so, I want to return to the words of Christ found in the Sermon on the Mount, beginning in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, Jesus says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room. When you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. Your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetition as the heathen do, For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore do not be like them. For your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I want us to remember as we hear these words that Christ in the sermon is teaching his disciples. You remember this how the sermon starts out in chapter 5. Jesus, seeing the multitude, goes up upon the mountain, and his disciples come to him. And then he opens his mouth and teaches them. So while we hear the words like hypocrite and heathen, Keep in mind that our Lord is using this language as He teaches those who call themselves by His name. He doesn't say, I know you guys are are doing a good job. You're not like the hypocrites. You're not like the heathen. You don't have to worry about that. We've got it all together. Keep up the good work. Instead, as He begins teaching about prayer and true worship, He gives a warning. He issues a command. Don't be like the hypocrite. Don't be like the heathen. And in issuing these commands and giving this instruction, our Lord is telling us about the reality of the temptation to fall into unbiblical patterns of prayer or to have our prayers motivated and fueled by an idolatrous or hypocritical ideology. What he wants us to get away as far as the big picture goes, what he wants us to take away is do not rest content with the fact that you pray. Even the hypocrite and the heathen pray. So Christ is giving us instruction to manifest that even His people are susceptible to inappropriate and unbiblical prayer. And what's worse is we're susceptible to hypocritical or paganistic prayer. The passage begins, as we heard in the last episode, with the priority of prayer, as Christ addresses the subject of prayer not with an if, but with a when. That is, Prayer is not some special spiritual gift. It's not a ministry. It's not a calling. It's not even an option. It's as natural and as necessary to the believer as breathing is to life. And then Christ began by addressing the hypocrite who prays publicly. He doesn't do so to forbid public prayer. The issue is not what the hypocrite was doing. The problem is not that he is praying. The problem is not even where he is praying. The problem is why the hypocrite was praying in public the way he was. Namely, his desire was to receive the praises of men. And our Lord teaches us that we ought not to pray like the hypocrite by contrasting the practice and the purpose of the hypocrite with the practice and purpose of the true child of God. He says, Don't be like the hypocrites praying on the street corners to be seen by men, but when you pray, go to the secret place. Shut out everything else and shut yourself in unto the Father and pray there in secret. The Father who is in secret will reward you. And in setting forth that contrast, you will remember the Lord is teaching us the motivation behind personal prayer is evidenced in the practice of personal prayer. So having considered the example of hypocritical prayer motivated by the praises of men, we move on in today's episode to see the Lord continue to teach us about prayer by way of another contrast. 
In the section we want to focus on today, the Lord sets before us the contrast of the prayer of the heathen and the prayer of the true child of God. So the first thing I want us to notice in this passage is the practice of prayer. And as we're doing so by way of contrast, we notice, first of all, the practice of the heathen. He says in verse number 7, When you pray, do not use vain repetition as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. As we think about this negative command, we want to ask ourselves, who are the heathen? Well, to the disciples, as they first heard these words, the heathen were those who were outside the commonwealth of Israel. But it was more than just an ethnicity issue. To be outside the commonwealth of Israel was to be ignorant about the knowledge of the true and living God. The heathen were those who had no special revelation. They had not been enlightened concerning the things of God that are necessary for life and salvation. The heathen were those who had taken the glory of God revealed in nature, His eternal power and His divine nature, and they had, as Paul said, exchanged them for images resembling mortal man and animals, birds and creeping things. The heathen were those who imagined gods in their own minds, gods to suit their passions, gods specifically invented to accomplish their own purpose, and therefore gods who were worshipped according to those same vain imaginations. And it is the heathen to which Christ points as the negative example here. It's the practice of the heathen, of the pagans, to pray by vain repetitions. Their prayer is nothing more than the heaping up of empty phrases, the insincere repeating of the same words over and over and over, or the same practices over and over. Their prayer becomes a kind of mind-numbing, heartless, thoughtless exercise of memory and noise. When I was a young believer, I had the opportunity to proclaim the gospel in the Himalayan mountains. And that part of the world is filled with Hindu so-called holy men, with shrines and temples, with Tibetan Buddhists, monks and nuns all over the place. And every time you would encounter a Tibetan Buddhist or a certain kind of Hindu on the road, they would have their prayer beads hanging from their hand, going from bead to bead, saying their mantra, lifting up their prayers, or going to the temple and spinning the prayer wheel so that every time the wheel spins, they would receive the merit or the credit for saying those words. Reminds me of the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings chapter 18, who stood and cried out from morning until noon, O Bell, O Bell, hear us, hear us, O Bell. In short, vain repetitions of the heathen refers to the prayer that is founded on, fueled by ignorance of God. I want to see here, connecting the idea of these rote, repetitious, heartless, mind-numbing prayers with the ignorance of who God is. It comes together as we see vain repetition is also described here as many words, or as the King James says, much speaking. This refers to the practice of lengthy, wordy, seemingly eloquent prayers. I mentioned the prophets of Baal, that they prayed from morning until noon. Or again, the Tibetans and the Hindus who spend hours a day in so-called prayer and meditation. Prayer that is focused on earning something before God based on its length or its time. That's the prayer and the practice of the heathen. It's the idea that prayer is nothing more than a good luck charm or a magical incantation. Something said just right or just long enough can cause change. That's the practice of the heathen. Well, we notice not just the practice of the heathen here, but secondly, we notice the practice of the child of God because Jesus says, when you pray, do not pray like the heathen do. Do not use vain, empty repetition as the heathen do. So in order to paint this contrast, the Lord says, don't do that. The prayer of a true believer is not vain. It's not to be empty. It's not to be a vain or empty repetition that thinks it will be heard because of its length or the amount of times it's been brought forth. Now, Jesus is not teaching That bringing the same thing before God in prayer is sinful. For the same Christ who is telling us here, do not pray 
lifting up vain repetitions as the heathen do, is the same Christ who told us, keep seeking, keep knocking, keep asking. It's coming from the same God who tells us in Scripture, you have not because you ask not. It's coming from the same Christ who went three times in Gethsemane in his agony. It's coming from the same Christ who commissioned the Apostle Paul who prayed for three seasons over his thorn in the flesh. It's coming from the same Christ who commanded us to pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send forth the laborers into the harvest field. So the Lord is not prohibiting repetition in prayer. He's prohibiting vain repetition. How many times have you stood in a church service or revival meeting, someone been called on to prayer, and literally before the person starts, you already know what's going to be said. Our Lord, gracious Heavenly Father, God, we come to you in prayer, God, asking that you would please, Lord God, please come by the help of your Spirit. And then from there it's just copy and paste every camp meeting or revival prayer that's ever been prayed. Or maybe you've heard those prayers before where the person praying says, Father God, Father God, Father God, Father God, every other word. Or the word-for-word prayer, like the prayers that are often uttered over offering times or before songs are sung, or before sermons are preached, or over the dinner table, or at bedtime. Now, listen to what I'm saying. I'm not saying that there's no room for growth in prayer, or that everyone ought to pray the same way I do, or that there's some external standard out there against these words. Understand there will be times of developmental repetition. My wife and I, we have six children, and one on the way, and It's interesting to see just the span of 16 months old to a little over 7 years old in the conversational language development between them. My 3-year-old son, Benji, in a conversation where he's telling me a story, will probably say dad about 15 times in a few sentences. My 7-year-old doesn't do that. And in fact, if Benji still done that when he was 12, there's probably some developmental issues there. That's what Jesus is talking about. He's he's not saying there's no place for growth in prayer. There's no place for developmental repetition. There's no place to learn and strive in prayer, or there's no prayer of the new believer. That's not what he's saying. The issue here is vain, insincere, thoughtless, heartless, rote repetition. And likewise, the Lord is not prohibiting or forbidding the practice of lengthy prayers. Scripture is full of passages and illustrations of lengthy prayers. Christ prayed all night. He was in the wilderness for 40 days. Daniel, upon seeing the dreaded vision of what was to come, spent three weeks in prayer. Paul prayed for three seasons. Praying for a long time is not the issue. The issue is praying for a long time because of the belief that God favors those long prayers more than short prayers. What Jesus is teaching his disciples all the way down to us as you hear this is God is not concerned with the quantity of words in your prayer. True prayer is not about length and it's not even about particular words. It's about the engagement of the mind and the affection. It's, in, it's about sincerity of mind and sincerity in the heart. Remember, I gave you that quote last week from John Bunyan about the definition of prayer. John Bunyan said, Prayer is a sincere, sensible, affectionate pouring out of the soul to God through Christ by the assistance of the Holy Spirit for things God has promised in His Word for the good of the church. This is the issue. This is striking the very chord of what we want to get to. You need to ask yourself, is there anything sincere about the exercise of repeating the same words over and over and over and over? Is there any affectionate pouring out of the soul in the long, lengthy prayers that are made for pretense or just to demonstrate theological knowledge? If the motivation in your prayer is merely to pray certain words, that's a vain repetition. If your motivation is to merely pray for an hour, that's vain, empty, pagan prayer. Jesus, again, had condemned the Pharisees for who, as he says in Matthew 23, for a pretense make long prayers. Some people listen to Brother Paul Washer preaching on prayer and 
then they decide in and of themselves, I'm, I'm going to be a man of prayer like Paul Washer said I should be, and I'm going to spend three hours in prayer tonight and watch the night and keep the night watch. If your goal is just to pray for a certain length of time, that's vain. Prayer is not concerned with counting minutes off the clock. It's concerned with God. Don't practice prayer that way. That's where Jesus begins with the instruction in our text. Don't pray like the heathen. Now he goes deeper than the mere practice of the heathen, just as he did with the hypocrites, because the practice is a symptom. The practice is just a manifestation of the foundational problem, and it's something we've been hinting at this whole time, namely, the practice of rote, vain repetitions and pretentious long prayers finds its foundational error in a wrong view of God and a wrong view of prayer. We want to notice that as we've considered not just the practice of prayer, but secondly, the position of prayer. And following with the contrast, we want to notice, first of all, the position of the heathen. Why is it that the heathen pray this way? Why do the pagans pray this way? Well, he says in verse 7, When you pray this way, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. The heathen pray this way from a position that views their God or their gods or their deities as needing to be convinced or persuaded or appeased in order to respond to them. What he's saying is they have a false view of God and they have a false view of prayer. In their view, their God is so distant, so unconcerned, so capricious or so passable that they must win his attention. They must convince him of their worthiness. They must pray long enough and hard enough to show they're sorry for the wrong things they have done and impress their God with their devotion. So they pray vain, repetitious prayers. They think that those particular words repeated enough enough times will get the attention of their God so as to convince their God to grant their requests. They spend hours a day hoping that their gods will see their commitment, will appreciate the time they invest and look upon them with favor and give them what they're praying for. Their ignorance of who God truly is and of what prayer truly is, mixed with the imagination of their sinful desires, manifests itself in their vain, repetitious praying. Their position is one that sees the strength and the effectiveness of their prayers as dependent upon their words, their repetition, or their commitment. It's an attempt to earn favor, to gain merit, or to persuade their God in order that they can receive what they want. We want to contrast that with the position of the true child of God. He says in verse 8, Therefore, do not be like them, for, here's our reason, your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. The danger is so real here that Christ gives a double, a double prohibition. Once at the beginning he says, when you pray, don't pray like the heathen. And then here again he says, do not be like them. Why? Because you are praying from a different position. He says, here's the reason. Your Father knows. If we could just grasp something of the grace and the power and the sweetness in these words. Our Lord is reminding us the position of a true child of God is just that. The position of a child of God. If you are a believer, you do not come in prayer to a moody God who needs to be convinced or persuaded by your own acts of religion to give you what you need. You come before Him as His child, as an object of His affection, as one for whom He has given His Son and one whom He has given to His Son. You come before Him as one whom He has adopted as His own one who has been accepted in the Beloved. You come to Him as a Father. So this means you have to begin understanding prayer in relationship to the biblical truth of your adoption as a son, as a daughter, as a child of God. Your relationship to God goes beyond that of just a creator and a creature. It goes beyond that just of a master and a servant. It goes beyond that just of God and a follower. It's a relationship of father and child. It's a relationship of 
protection. That we know God is working all things together for good for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. It's a relationship of provision. We know, as Paul prayed for the Philippians, that God will supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. It's a relationship of affection where we have been brought in by the blood of Christ to participate in this love of God the Father loving us as His children. It's a relationship of delight. That Christ is not ashamed to be called our brother and so He calls us in as our brother to come to the throne, to petition the Father in His name. It's a relationship of discipline where we know that our Father is not going to leave us to our own folly, but that He disciplines and corrects corrects us in order that we may share in His holiness because without holiness we won't see Him. It's a relationship of concern where Peter can tell us, cast your anxieties and your cares on Him because He cares for you. Think about that. The God of the universe cares for you. It's a relationship of guidance and instruction where He hasn't left us fumbling and stumbling around in the darkness of our own vain imaginations, but He's revealed Himself and His will and His Word so that as we come to Him in prayer, we might know how to pray rightly. And because we are His children, because you are His child in Christ, it's a relationship of confidence where Paul can say, we now have boldness and access with confidence to the throne of grace through our faith in Christ. And just to put the proverbial cherry on top of the ice cream sundae, if you are a believer, you are in this relationship because of God. Scripture tells us of His own will, He brought us forth by the word of truth. Scripture tells us in 1 Peter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again. He's the one who has undertaken the work. He's the one that has adopted us as His children. He is the one who sent His Son to accomplish redemption. He is the one who decreed before eternity passed that He would have a people, that He would give them to His Son. He is the one who wrote Your name down in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, the Apostle says, but according to His own mercy. If you are in this relationship as a child of God, it's all of God. It's all of grace. Because of Him we are in Christ, Paul told the Corinthians. We didn't adopt Him as our Father. He adopted us as His children. We didn't have any rights or any privileges or any inheritance or giftedness to give to Him. But He has given to us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. We did not cause ourselves to be born again into His family. He caused us to be born again. We did not earn a right to belong to His family. He sent His Son to bash down the gates of the domain of darkness and transfer us into His own kingdom so that we might receive adoption as sons. When the fullness of time had come, He sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem us from under the law so that we might receive adoption as His sons and daughters. And that is the position from which we must pray. This is the true foundation and the true fuel of biblical, God-exalting, Christ-honoring, Spirit-empowered, gospel-centered prayer. You must understand your position before God. He is your Father. That's the key to this passage on prayer. If you, you look back and you say, as he's, t- as he's contrasting the prayer of the hypocrite to the true child, he says, go to your Father in secret. You look here in the contrast between the heathen and the child of God. He says, your father knows what you need. We look down and as he gives us the pattern, as we'll see in verse 9, it begins with these words, our father. You must realize who he is and you must realize what he has done to change your standing before him and adopt you as his child. And you must realize who you are before him in Christ. And then you pray from that position. He is your Father. And, Jesus goes on to say, your Father, He knows. He knows. He is the living, 
Almighty, declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, the things not yet done, nothing can be hidden from His sight. He knows. He knows all things, yes, but specifically, He knows your needs before you ask. Jesus doesn't just point to the omniscience, infinite knowledge of God in general. He's applying infinite knowledge in an intimate way to you as a child of God. He knows what you need. He knows what you truly need. He knows your situation better than you do. He knows what's necessary for your sanctification. He knows what He has decreed concerning you. He knows what is truly good for you and truly for His glory. And He's promised that He is working all things together for our good to conform us to the image of His Son. This means prayer is not about bending the divine will. Prayer is not about persuading God to respond or impressing Him with devotion or knowledge. He already knows. Prayer is not a tool of persuasion. It's a means of communion. It's children coming to their Father, the Father who knows all things and who has promised to give every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. There's no need for vain repetitions as a means of trying to earn His favor or impress Him. There's no magic words that you're going to say that's going to unlock the throne room. He knows, and He's able, and He works all things together for the good of His people. Now, as you hear that, the proper response is not to conclude, okay, well, He knows, I'm His child, I don't even need to ask. He commands you to ask. You see, we're actually in our true and proper place when we live in a constant awareness of our utter dependence on God the Father for absolutely everything. And we express this true and proper position as we come to Him, as His children in prayer. We come and we express this awareness. We we express our gratitude. We express His praise and His power. We claim His promises as a child who comes to their Father to rest confidently and joyfully in His presence. We come and we ask. You remember, the Scripture tells us, you have not because you ask not. Prayer is the means that God has determined to bring about much of His will. It's the prayers of His people that lay hold of His throne that bend His ear to where He hears and He answers and then He acts and we see His glory and we turn to prayer again to praise Him. But we also want to deal with the biblical reality that at other times, it's the silence of God's people that keep His hand held back. Again, James told the believers, you have not because you ask not. So it doesn't mean you don't pray. It doesn't mean you don't need to ask. He's given you prayer so that you might come and ask. Now, it's also important for us to note this does not mean there will never be seasons of repetitious prayer. As we've already said, Jesus is not condemning the repetitious prayer in and of itself because there will be times where God is pleased to take you through a season of striving and agonizing in prayer. But remember, this striving is not to impress him or bend his will or to cause him to change his mind and his eternal decree. It's not about earning his favor or impressing him with your devotion. These seasons are for your sanctification. Remember Jacob, how he wrestled with God. He had come back to Bethel and out of fear of his brother, he sends drove after drove of gifts and treasures just trying to appease his brother. He feared Esau more than he feared and trusted God. And as he decides to go on to Bethel that night, Scripture tells us a man wrestled with him. And we know from the Scriptures that this was the Lord he wrestled with. And all of the mystery of that great great scene aside, what we see here is Jacob would not let him go. He continued to strive. He continued to wrestle. And he wrestled with him all night. And as the dawn is breaking and the angel of the Lord says, let me go, he says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. There was striving There was agonizing. There was wrestling. But what happened? Did the angel of the Lord leave differently? Was this pre-incarnate manifestation of God altered in any way? No. 
Jacob left there walking differently. He left there with a different name. The striving was about God's changing Jacob, not Jacob changing God. And we think again of the example of the Apostle Paul pleading before the Lord concerning his thorn in the flesh. Three times he prayed, he said. And what's the result? Was the thorn taken away? No. But in his striving, the Lord tells him, my grace is sufficient for you. And sufficient grace was given. So yes, there will be seasons where you bring the same thing before the Lord over and over and over. And we ought to do that. And we're commanded to do that. We're commanded to pray for one another. Commanded, as I said, to pray earnestly that the Lord would send forth laborers into his harvest. We're praying for the salvation of our children, for the revival of our nation, for the sanctification of the saints. All of these things that God has revealed that are according to his will. And we stand in time praying and striving and agonizing that these things would come to pass. But as we do that, we must come with a proper understanding of who God is, of our position before Him in Christ, and that this praying, this striving, this coming before Him, continuing to seek, continuing to knock, continuing to ask, has to be done according to His will. We have to come before Him with a proper view of who He is and a proper view of prayer, not like that of the heathen who think God is going to hear us because of our much words or our vain, empty repetitions. Now let me ask you, do you have the practice of the heathen in your prayer? Are you praying the same thing over and over and over, thinking that if you pray enough, you will eventually change God's mind and get what you're asking for? Are your prayers made up of and constructed by lofty theological statements where you're praying in the assembly using all of your theological knowledge just to impress the brethren, just to impress God. You have the practice of the heathen or the child of God. As you engage in what you often think of as a spiritual discipline of prayer, are you getting up early in the morning and praying for an hour just so you can pat yourself on the back and say, I pray for an hour every day? Or are you coming before God as your Father because of what He has done for you in Christ, casting your cares on Him, claiming His promises, resting and receiving grace and mercy? Is your prayer sensible and sincere, or is it thoughtless and cold? The prayers that you pray, could you literally pray them half asleep, without even thinking, uttering and muttering through those words while you're texting or listening to something in the background? Or or is your prayer sensible and sincere? Is there an affectionate pouring out of your soul to the Father or just a mere repetition of biblical terminology? Do you pray from a position of trying to persuade, impress, or obtain your will from God? Or do you pray from the position of a child of the Almighty God who knows what you need, knows what you need even before you ask, and yet still gives you the privilege of coming and asking? I think about my own children. Times where they're playing in the house and the bouncy ball or the Nerf basketball or football gets stuck up on the counter or on top of the fridge, and I'm sitting watching the scene play out. And as my two sons come to me to ask me to get the ball down, I already know what they're going to ask. I already know that I can do it for them. And as they come to me, I don't say, shut up, don't ask. I already know what you're going to ask, and yes, I can do it. Just give me a second. I let them come, and I let them ask. And it puts a smile on my face. brings joy to my heart to see them come to me as children, coming to their father to ask for help for something that they know only I can do for them. Is that how you understand prayer? Are you a child coming to Almighty God who, yes, knows what you need, but who delights in the prayers of His people and calls you to come and has given you all this access in Christ to come with boldness and confidence and every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places and all the promises revealed in His Word and now calls you in the name of Christ to come? Is that how you come? 
Or do you pray like the heathen? I say these things to encourage you, brothers and sisters, to realize what a great spiritual privilege has been given to us in prayer and to call you to take up this great weapon of our warfare and fight the good fight of faith, praying at all times in the most holy faith and in the power of the Holy Spirit. My name is Jordan Grogan, and you've been listening to the Church Militant Podcast.